Legend tells us that Nymeria took ten thousand ships to sea, searching for a new home for her people beyond the long reach of Illyria and its dragon lords. Beldica argues that this number was vastly inflated, perhaps as much as tenfold. Other chroniclers offer other numbers, but in truth no true count was ever made. We can safely say there were a great many ships. Most were river craft, skiffs and pole boats, trading galleys, fishing boats, pleasure barges, even rafts, their decks and holds crammed full of women and children and old men. Only one in ten was remotely seaworthy, Beldacar insists. Nymeria's voyage was long and terrible. More than a hundred ships foundered and sank in the first storm her fleet encountered, as many or more turned back in fear and were taken by slavers out of Atlantis. Others fell behind or drifted away, never to be seen again. The remainder of the fleet limped across the summer sea to the Basilisk Isles. One of the things I find special about the Song of Ice and Fire fandom is that George R. R. Martin's books have taught us to consider perspectives other than our own. The nature of seeing the story via differing POVs lends itself to us exercising whatever parts of the brain we use when trying to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. We'll call them our perspective muscles. <laughs> this thinking is necessary in the real world, really valuable in the real world. So it's good that we get a little practice while we play in Martin's world. A proper and considerate perspective of others who aren't like you, and even those who are, can literally be a matter of life and death, or of fairness and justice, or just basic human understanding. The journey of the Roinar is a particularly great workout for our perspective muscles, because in this episode we're going to see some of the most basic human emotions coupled with some of the most confusing and hard to understand human emotions, such as the nature of human existence, that we carry within us instincts developed millennia ago. They'll experience so many different cultures and circumstances and forms of suffering, all with the backdrop of these feelings and these unknown circumstances. Fear would likely be the most common emotion shared amongst the Roinar at this time. Sure, there'd be others, but fear would probably be number one. I tried to come up with a clever way to write about fear before deciding to just quote H.P. Lovecraft instead, someone who spent his entire career writing about fear. He said, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. And the unknown is what the Roy and I were headed for. But if we're on top of our perspective game, we know that sometimes what's known to some is unknown to others. What's familiar to some is unfamiliar to others. But Sathorios is unknown to all, yet known to be deadly and dangerous at the same time. Somehow we've got a combination of fear of the unknown and fear of the known. Along with fear, though, there's another ancient and powerful instinct, which is the will to survive, the will to live. For those whom fear does not paralyze, the will to survive wins out, and fear is converted to adrenaline and other useful energies. The story of the Roinar is a story of fear and survival and perspective and so much more, like giant toads and butterfly gods. You'll see and hear all about it. So hello and welcome to the next episode of History of Westeros. Back again, I'm Aziz. Ashe is the best on the other side of the camera, and you'll hear her voice throughout this episode as well. Same with Mikal Schick, who is doing the voices for this episode. Follow her on Twitter, at Ink as Rain. And uh, she's also on the Vassals of Kingsgrave podcast, as well as uh, uh, employed with by HappyBull.com. So she's out there in a lot of places and doing great voices for us. So Valar sustain us. Here we are. Part two with this series, but it serves as a standalone. All three parts of the Nymeria series don't really depend on each other. They're very episodic. They're very split. They tell each tell their own story. I'd say it's best to have them all together. But this episode is totally fine on its own. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. As always, we're always evolving the podcast, always trying to make changes, always trying to make it more appealing for you guys, and always trying to make our process more efficient, better. And just in this episode, we've got new lighting, we've got a new mic stand, little things like that that, that hopefully improve our sound and lighting. But on the Patreon side, we have a, a thing we've changed. In the past, we've occasionally done... 
episodes that the higher level patrons get to vote on. And this has worked pretty well, but the problem is sometimes we choose a topic and it grows into multiple episodes. And if we have a topic that grows into multiple episodes, that changes the schedule of when we can have a vote. And well, this year that's happened a lot in particular. It's happened a lot in the past, but 2018 it's happened the most. We had a Blood Raven episode that we thought would maybe be one or two episodes that turned into three. This Nymeria series, I thought maybe it would be one or two, but it's three. And so a lot of things have grown up. Same with the Mandalay episode. Mandalay episode, I thought that would be one, and it was two pretty big episodes. And uh, one thing to do with that is, well, I'm not great at these estimates. <laughs> I share, I have that in common with George, I suppose. But we can always change course and make do. So what we're going to do from now on is until the Winds of Winter comes out, all episodes will be Patreon voters episodes. And Patreon voters have kicked ass with their choices. Crypts of Winterfell, Septon Barth, this series, lots of good stuff, Summer Hall. So leaving it in y'all's hands has worked out really great for us. So let's keep that going. Let's boost that. So again, until the Winds of Winter, $12 and up patrons get to vote on every single episode until we, that is starting with the ones once we're wrapped up with these current series that are still ongoing. And that's going to involve topics from Fire and Blood, which of course is coming out, well, you may, it may already be out by the time you're seeing this episode, depends. But either way, we're all going to be digesting that and doing a lot of episodes about it. With that in mind, I also want to give our shout outs. So thanks to Jeff Gnarly, the long snapper, History of Westeros' first sword. Thanks to Lord Mark of House Joseph, the Snow in Winterfell, rider of Masla Cartho, the White Dragon with green scales, horns, wings, and talons. Talanis the Talon is King of Gagasos, a topic of this episode, rider of Talarius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of midnight black. Jinx of House Lier is Green Queen of the Rainwood, rider of Erogenia, a sylphic albino dragon with amethyst eyes and opalescent wings. And Robert IV of House Ardeacor, burned king of Blazewater Bay, rider of Atroxus, a black dragon with bioluminescent spots like smoldering embers and a banded blue tail. Also, if you follow our Crusader Kings 2 game streams, the currently the long campaign of House Horror, that's H-O-A-R-E, of course, the ones that Aegon the Conqueror made extinct. Well, in this game timeline, they're not extinct. In fact, they're doing quite well. Those used to be on our History of Westeros channel, but we've moved them to Twitch. Follow us on twitch.tv slash historyofwesteros. And also you can follow our new gaming channel where we host the replays. Any stream of the games that we put up is going to find its way over to Westeros History Gaming. It's a brand new channel. I don't even think there's 20 subscribers yet. We just put it up and have hardly announced it. So it's all the game replays will be posted there. Let's get going. Last episode had a lot of Tyrion, and he'll be back in this episode as well, a bit. We'll also see some Victarion. And, but again, the most relevant in Song of Ice and character parallel is almost certainly Daenerys. Tyrion is obsessed with Lomas Longstrider and has been to some amazing places, including several world wonders that he read about as a kid. Victarion is an actual sailor in a sailing culture with a whole fleet. And he sails all the way to Slaver's Bay, splitting his fleet into three, each traveling a route we'd love to see not experience. Both of these two, Tyrion and Victarion, are a lot older than Daenerys, yet she's been to more exotic and dangerous and interesting places than both of them put together. I think you can make that argument. I do. She's been on the move constantly, and even when it looks like she's going to stay in one place for a while, Marine, well, off she goes, doing that go backwards to go forwards thing. Nymeria and the Rhoynar will do the same in their own way. As we'll see, they'll first try to make a new home on their own, only to find the only new homes available are in some really terrible neighborhoods. In the end, the independent Rhoynar will have to go live in someone else's house. For Nymeria herself, that will be House Martell. That probably felt like a step back at first, even though in the end, it did work out really well for all involved. As far as we know. <laughs> Maybe not for the Ironwoods, but we'll get to that story later. That's the story for part three. Here in part two, we're delving deep into those attempts to make a new home on their own. And specifically, those really terrible neighborhoods imagined by George R. R. Martin. We're going to focus on those a lot. Some of these terrible neighborhoods are still around. One of the reasons Danny and her small group weren't quickly disposed of by one of the new smaller Kalisars, which formed from Drogo's huge Kalisar is because she was beneath notice. The new calls were concerned with each other, attracting men to follow them. Power plays, basically. Danny's little group of a hundred 
were no threat to anyone, and they didn't offer any benefits, really, either. It may have been a bit similar for Nymeria. Sure, even with the doubt expressed in that opening quote, we're still talking around a thousand ships, at least, if not closer to 10,000, the number we're given. It would be easy for the Valyrians to sink that fleet, though, right? Dragons would make it almost simple. But, but on the other hand, while I'm sure there were some dragon lords who thought that sounded like a fun way to spend a few evenings, there's not really any money in it. And there was huge, wealthy, ruinous cities just sitting there waiting to be plundered since everybody fled, right? And their fellow dragon lords probably weren't waiting around to share. You might say, well, what about capturing those Rhoynar and enslaving them? That is what the Valyrians do, after all. That's a fair point. But you'd need a lot of people to do this. You'd have to have ships of your own. You can't just burn the ships and then collect the slaves afterwards. That's not going to work. You'll kill them all. So it's a lot of effort. It's, it's kind of rough to think about this. But still, I'd think the prospect of massive loot just sitting there in those cities was a more important for the Valyrians. It may have been kind of an ironically helpful diversion to help the Rhoynar escape. Hey, look, take all that gold over here while we sneak away this way. And then maybe they use some of their water magic to assist the escape, right? We've seen fogs do a whole lot along the Rhoin. So concealing ships, that doesn't seem out of bounds at all. That's actually pretty straightforward as far as these things go. Heck, Bravos, a whole city, was partly concealed by fog for so long, Valyria didn't even know where, that they existed for a while and then didn't know where they were for a long time. It took Bravos revealing themselves to the world for that to happen. As for their intended destination, it seems they may have chosen Sothorios from the outset. If we look at the map, their route is not direct. They could have gone straight to Dorne or any of the other eventual destinations first. One of the first questions we considered is a question that has existed in the fandom for quite some time. We know the Roinar ended up in Dorne, but, but we also know they went to quite a few other places first. So why didn't they head to Westeros sooner? Why wasn't that their first choice? And the follow-up question is, why Sothorios, no matter what the other answers are? Because that base is basically a nightmare, right? <laughs> Straight south is the Summer Isles, a place they ended up for a while later. So it's interesting. And I think the initial question is easier than the follow-up. Westeros and the Summer Isles are and were full of people who would not necessarily be friendly to a whole bunch of foreigners just showing up ready to move in, even if they were mostly women. And right... There's supposed to be a joke about, haha, of course the Dornishmen were happy to have a bunch of women show up like that. But that's kind of the point. Among other reasons, it's exactly why a group of mostly women wouldn't want to go live where there's already a bunch of men. Right? This is, the, uh, this is a perspective question that comes up really big here. Even though they had quite a few warrior women in the group, they were still a refugee population. And far too many men look at a refugee population of women as some kind of opportunity rather than something to treat with compassion and to help out, right? Especially in this setting. But on the other hand, the Roinar didn't exactly have a lot of choices. But they did pick a chance to carve out their own destiny rather than submitting to someone else's laws or things worse than laws. But talk about the proverbial rock in a hard place here. Forging a new life on a wild frontier trope it may seem romantic, but we're talking about the disease-ridden, horror-filled jungle of Sothorios. It's not so romantic. According to the Maesters, anyway. That's what they think Sothorios is like. Which is a point in and of itself. More perspective is necessary here. What we're told about the world of ice and fire with regards to Sothorios isn't necessarily all that similar to what the Roinar knew about it. Especially considering there's a time gap here of... Seven to a thousand years? Seven hundred to a thousand years? Something like that? For example, a statement like this. Slavers, traders, and treasure hunters have visited Sothorius over the centuries, but only the boldest ever venture far from their coastal garrisons and enclaves to explore the mysteries of the continent's vast interior. Those that dare, more oft than not, set forth into the green, never to be seen again. So that's a good example of a maester's educated opinion, right? Mostly formed by reading. And as we talked about in the first episode, there are some issues with only reading about things. The maesters are unlikely to have all the best sources, right? On Sothorios, anyway. Other things, sure. 
You could say that the descendants of the Roinar who lived in Sithorios are still um, alive in Westeros and a few other places today. And they're still likely telling some of those tales. I bet if some of the maesters went and interviewed some of the orphans of the Greenblood, they might get some interesting stories passed down to them. But this would be something like seven centuries of knowledge passed down, so it would probably have drifted a little bit still. It'd probably be a fantastic story. The point being, though, there's still something to be said for perspective even in this. It's not just the maesters who likely have a few things wrong. The Roinar's perspective might have been off. In fact, decent chance it was. As we saw in part one, they weren't the most outward-looking people. They were internally focused. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it, it is a problem for them now, in this scenario. Lots of reasons to love them, for sure. But they weren't at the top of the list for knowledge of people and places around the world. And that was maybe a shortcoming of theirs. And that's kind of come up big here. Since the story of Nymeria and the Roinar is filled with parallels to Daenerys, I find this to be a brilliant but subtle piece of writing by George R. R. Martin. He wrote the Roinar as a people who are highly cultured but not worldly. They stay on the Roin. And a big reason they like to stay home is because home was amazing. <laughs> they had the best place to live in the world, probably. But even more importantly, it was home. Home is whatever you make it, and it had been their home for eons, uncountable years. Home can seem like the best, even when it probably wouldn't seem that way to anyone else. But in the Reinhardt's case, it probably would seem like the best <laughs> to anyone coming from anywhere, at least often enough. And you can be proud of that, right? If your home is something that everyone looks with, with awe, you know, that, imagine the pride that people would have in a home that everyone praises. And then imagine the sorrow of having that and losing it. So that's another piece of important perspective to keep in mind as well throughout this episode. Every time the Roinar arrive at a new destination, many of them just wouldn't be able to help but compare it to what they'd lost. And nothing would ever compare to Mother Roin, especially not in Sothorios. As they sailed off despite their own dangers, many would think of those left behind who couldn't escape. They'd be aware that right in that very moment, their cities were being looted and burned. This would reflect in their culture as well. Reinar music would have taken a turn. There'd be less love and joy, more sorrow and tragedy. Ditto artwork and sculptures and anything along those lines. Any sort of books that were being written, if they could even still do that. Maybe they didn't have paper. Think of how the Palace of Love became the Palace of Sorrow, and you get the idea. That's it in a nutshell. There would be depression and trauma, and some might just jump into the sea and end it. But the will to live was strong in many, and they persisted. The journey of Nymeria and the Roinar could be called an odyssey. It is quite a lot like the story where Odyssey gets its name, which is, well, the Odyssey. The Greek hero Odysseus was lost at sea for much longer than Nymeria, and he too encountered many different lands, mostly islands, and fantastic creatures. Unlike Nymeria, though, Odysseus eventually got to go back home. The name 10,000 Ships also reminds us of the famous 10,000 mercenaries of ancient Greece, as recorded by Xenophon. They fought for Cyrus the Younger against Artaxerxes for the Persian throne, only to find themselves stranded and leaderless in a foreign land. They had to fight their way back through many hostile lands and unknown peoples while facing disease, exposure, and starvation. But, like Odysseus, they also eventually got to go home. How unfair for the Roinar. Beauty and the Basilisk. A concept that we see with Danny, Sansa, Cersei, Arianne, and several others is the power of beauty in politics and leadership. There's a version of this for men, too. Consider the star power of Damon Blackfire, Renly Baratheon. Those are handsome guys. But that's another story. This one's about Nymeria, who seems to belong in this category, too. And as the world of ice and fire calls her fierce and beautiful. Just like Sansa or Danny, it would be completely wrong to say their popularity is rooted in their looks, but it would also be wrong to say it's irrelevant. It, it matters, for sure. Cersei quite clearly tells Sansa to use her beauty as a weapon, and she takes this advice to heart. Men will fight over the right to wear a lady's favor. They will do crazy things to win the attention of a beautiful highborn woman. Even just a little attention, really. It's kind of crazy. Think Aris Oakhart if you want a really extreme example of, of a guy losing it. <laughs> He's a good example here as well, though. Though I have no idea if Nymeria was sleeping with anyone, that's not the point. The point is Aris was young and impressionable and capable of extreme suicidal bravery, as we saw. 
There would be plenty of guilt and shame among the Roinar people, even the young people who could not have really done anything. Still, they'd be, they'd be thinking, I wish I'd done more to prevent the fall of our people. Now, perhaps Nymeria was skilled at handling these raw and painful emotions widespread among her people. Maybe she was able to turn that into something productive. That's the mark of a good leader, and she did lead them throughout all this time. Perhaps not, though. I'm just guessing. But if this quote is any indication, she was at least good at getting something a little extra out of her people through the knowledge that they would be pleasing her. Her esteem was powerful. Princess Eleandra came young to her seat and thought herself a new Nymeria. A fiery young woman, she encouraged her lords and knights to prove themselves worthy of her favors by raiding in the marches. Aleandra is, of course, Nymeria's descendant and seems to be emulating her. So if this is what we see from how to emulate Nymeria, then we've got a clue here. But Princess Aleander presided over a united and strong and independent dorm, while Princess Nymeria presided over a lost people who frequently found themselves in desperate, dangerous situations. They were constantly faced with unknowns, and the unknowns in Sothorios are often deadly again, remember? And let's not forget our lesson about fear of the unknown. In other words, the trials and tribulations and constant dangers the Roinar dealt with were also opportunities to prove their bravery. And this after a long time at sea where many of them would have been pretty helpless just sitting on a ship, not to mention ashamed at having to leave home at having lost to Valyria, the long enemy. Recall the demographics here too, and that there was a lack of adult males. And the formerly numerous female warrior class would be largely gone as well. There were still many of them left, but generally speaking, there was just a lack of adults, period with a disproportionate amount of elders and children in the group. The leadership roles would be filled by elders for the most part, I think. Just guessing. It makes sense, right? But the active roles, the new warrior class, the new people that had to exert themselves on a regular basis to get things done, the roles that required strength and stamina and agility and maybe youth, well, that's where we would expect a lot of these young people to start stepping up. So you'd see young people getting experience at an earlier age than they would have by necessity. Many of these young people would probably be inclined to commit conspicuous acts of bravery, to get noticed, to earn these roles. Think of it. Most of the bravest were gone. It was a time for new heroes to emerge, and this would be a shining star on the horizon for many who had lost just about everything. At least it was a chance to prove themselves. At least it was an opportunity to rise among their society. The girls would want to be like Nymeria, a lot of them, and the girls and boys would both want to win her favor. And she's not married. That'll come up later, too. Even though they were headed towards attempted independence in Sothorios, she may have anticipated needing to marry a local ruler wherever they settled and kept her options open in case it came to that. But she needn't actually tell anyone that, right? <laughs> she could have kept it kind of open-ended and used that mystery as an incentive to other Roinar who maybe wanted to marry her. They would do great deeds to try to win her affection or attention, even though they... Probably didn't have a chance. Discounting problems of sea and weather and logistics and marriage proposals, the first chance anyone would have to show bravery against a foe would be the first place they came to. So whatever the reasons the Roinar chose Sothorios as their new home, it meant passing through the Basilisk Isles. Thus, Nymeria and the 10,000 ships had to lead her people through what isn't such a nice place, it's the first bad neighborhood we're going to talk about, on their way to migrating to... An even less nice place. Call it a warm-up? A toughening for worse things to come? Ugh. The Basilisk Isles are the islands off the northwestern coast of Sothorios. There's some creepy cool stuff going on down here. Ancient peoples, lost cities, fantastical beasts. Let's talk about it. Basilisks, the creatures the isles are named after, were apparently more common on the isles in ancient days, but are either wiped off the islands or nearly so. More on them and many other fearsome creatures when we get to Sothorios. There are some creatures aren't the problem on the Basilisk Isles, despite the name. Indeed, the people are the problem here. The Basilisks have for long centuries been the festering sore of the summer sea, inhabited only by corsairs, pirates, slavers, sellswords, murderers and monsters, the worst of humanity. They come from every land beneath the sun, it is said, for only here can such men hope to find others of their own ilk. Since the people are said to come from all over, the locals would have had a very diverse genetic makeup, and it's not clear if there are true natives or if the first humans in the area came from, say, Essos, or perhaps the Summer Islanders, for example, if not from Sothorios itself, right? 
So we meet a few characters from the Basilisk Isles in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like this one, whom Dario tells us is a new recruit for the Stormcrows. He sounds excited for Danny to meet him. An axeman from the Basilisk Isles. A brute bigger than Belwas, he says. A brute bigger than Belwas from the Basilisks? Boom. Ex bit excited to meet him too. Daenerys' story has quite a lot to do with uniting disparate peoples, right? The stallion who mounts the world is supposed to have the biggest Kalasar ever, so it's fitting that her army is gradually getting even more diverse as it grows larger. It's going to be interesting and at times bloody when Westeros has to confront its xenophobia about several different cultures all at once, coming with Danny, right? What will surprise them more? Things they've never seen before? Or never seen before versions of things they have seen before? We're touching a little bit on... Fear of the unknown and fear of the known again, and of course, we're touching on perspective again. Many in Westeros would be shocked to see the likes of Sir Tumco Lowe, who may be the first ever knight from the Basilisk Isles. Like, first ever, ever. Not just in the series. He is black as Maester's ink, it says. But it isn't his skin color that would surprise people, at least not much. A dark-skinned knight would not be a new sight in Westeros, given the salty Dornish, whose blood is quite a lot of our subject Roinar. Rather, Sir Tumko was casually ticketed for greatness by George R. R. Martin. Barristan Selmy considers him the best natural swordsman he's seen since Jamie Lannister. Strong and fast. That is a huge compliment. What a thing to say. Jamie is incredible was incredibly gifted. So keep an eye on Tumko Low, I'd say. Watch out. And won't that also be a shock to Westeros? Sir Barristan the Bold, one of the most famous knights ever to live in Westeros, certainly one of the most famous recently, knighted this basilisk knight himself. Huh. What are they going to think of that? Or will Barristan change sides and follow the prince or king who thinks he's the son of Rhaegar? And will Sir Tumko follow Sir Barristan if so? He barely knows the mother of dragons. So we'll see. Interesting question, isn't it? We asked the History of Westeros podcast Facebook group to give name suggestions for Sir Tumko Low. Most popular suggestions were The Dragonglass Knight by Kurt Kuhlman and Tumko Thrice Tried by Rodney Carrico. Thrice for the Fighting Pits, Knighthood, and War. Shira Seastar gave us Sir Tumko Low's motto. They go high, we go low. That's pretty good. New beginnings from old traditions. As Daenerys faces the potential of internal rifts, so too should we consider that questions of leadership may have plagued Nymeria as well. But if so, she clearly handled those problems and remained in charge, right? Though we compare her to Danny, Nymeria is perhaps more impressive here, having not performed any miracles <laughs> along the lines of hatching dragon eggs that we know of. Like, seriously, how are you going to not follow someone that does that? Nymeria... Well, she's an amazing leader, apparently, but she didn't perform any miracles. Daenerys is building a new government as she goes. A, a new set of power structures, new organizations. And she's doing it while balancing the needs of several cultures living together, many of whom who have not had to live together before. When I put it that way, it sounds really hard, right? Well, that challenge is only going to continue to grow. But so will her experience in dealing with such situations. And we can expect her to add new talent to her leadership team as she's been doing along the way. And those new talents will hopefully help with some of this. This is extremely similar to what we imagined for the Roinar, but with several added challenges. The Roinar would also have to appoint new leaders to new roles based on their new circumstances, all while having to learn new skills. As a people, they would be gradually changing to something else. A society rebuilt anew in a new location is bound to be new, right? Still, many if not most would want to preserve as much of Roinar culture as possible. But there's no way around the fact that so much would be different. How can you have a religion based around a river you don't live on anymore? The old man in the river, a turtle, lives in the river they fled from. They worship that. Well, they're going to still worship that? Yes, the answer is yes, they still are. But still, not being able to see it, that's a huge difference. And there's much worse things than turtles living in the river where they're heading. And they're not going to worship those. Imagine worshipping a school of piranha or a giant crocodile. Yeah, I can imagine it, but it's weird. They could and probably did still worship the old man and Mother Roin, like I said, because the orphans of the Greenblood still did, so the Roinar before them probably did, that makes sense. But again, clearly nothing beats the real thing. Here I want you to recall what I said about the power of awe. How Tyrion was impressed by the Roin in books, but astonished when seeing it in person. Impressed and astonished, there's a pretty big difference between those two, right? <laughs> and that's what the Roinar were reduced to here. 
Gone were the days of the river simply being right there to blow the mind of anyone who saw it, all while providing life to so many. Gone were the days of, Mom, Dad, I get why we worship that, while pointing at the river. Newborn Roinar, we only hear stories. And those stories would be relevant and told passionately and reverently, but they'd be stories. They wouldn't have the real thing. The sad fact was that many pillars of Roinish culture were now gone, and irreplaceably so. No matter where they went, it would never be anything like home. And the Roinar would start to merge with these new peoples that they lived amongst. In the end, of course, this would mostly be with the Dornish. But along the way, a few of the locals from the many prior attempts at colonization would have joined them for various reasons, such as employment, or as mercenaries, or sailors, or laborers, or administrators, or just marrying into it. Many would want to learn from the Roinar and their advanced craftsmanship. Some might be drawn to Roinar music or worship, maybe even the magic. They might not have the same materials to build with, no pink and green marble in Sithorios, probably, but they'd still have the knowledge of how to build, and that would be valuable. And what of love? The Roinar would still remember that cornerstone of that culture, embodied in places like the Palace of Love, gone but surely not forgotten. Perhaps many way, gave way to despair, but definitely not everyone. I doubt that seriously. Now, we can't always be certain which, but some elements of Roinish culture would not be lost by the forced migration and the conditions of their new colonies. These traditions that they held dear to, the ones they could hold dear to, would perhaps become the new cornerstones. Maybe they would rise in esteem because they were more prevalent. And this is showing you how their culture would be evolving, kind of becoming a new society altogether in many ways. Thoughts of this nature, and many others, would be on Nymeria's mind during the voyage. But perhaps those thoughts would be paused as they caught sight of the Basilisk Isles for the first time. The future was becoming now. What did they know about these isles before arriving? There are forgotten ruins on the Basilisk Isles. Some nameless civilization from the Dawn Age or earlier lived there once. Perhaps the Roinar knew, or once knew, who they were. Maybe really long ago they traded with them. Maybe. But the people who live there now were more of a pressing concern. The rest is just an interesting question. Who lived there thousands of years ago wasn't going to help them with any of their problems. The new locals repurposed the structures of these long-dead builders in many cases. In one case, the Corsairs built a fortress using stones from one of these ancient cities. As for the lay of the land, islands in this case, there are some smaller unnamed ones, but the seven named isles are the Isle of Toads, the Isle of Tears, the Isle of Flies, Skull Isle, Axe Isle, Talon, and Howling Mountain. I said the people were the problem, but even without the people, it's got major issues. Life on the basilisks is nasty, brutal, and oft short. Hot, humid, and swarming with stinging flies, sand fleas, and bloodworms, these islands have always proved singularly unhealthy for man and beast alike. Still, people do live there, and they are at least somewhat connected to the other continents. Ships from the basilisk isles trade in many places around the world. I saw no examples in King's Landing, but Quentin sees a ship from the basilisks in Volantis. Perspective again. Here we go. As it always is with trade, you can make a lot by taking something considered mundane by the locals to a place where it is considered exotic. And Sothorios is a lot of things that are valuable anywhere you go. But quite often the cargo is slaves. The Basilisk Isles are full of slavers, so the Roiner, while fleeing slavery at the hands of Lyria, had to face more slavers. Worse, the slavers of the Basilisk Isles were not unlikely to turn around and sell them to Valyria. So either way, you end up a Valyrian slave in a lot of these cases. So with that one very large exception of slavery in mind, as bad as the islands are all around, they're still preferable to the mainland, somehow. The islands are clear of the thing that they were named for. But there's no chance humans can drive species to extinction on this huge continent like they could on a mere island. Victorian, of all people, gives us his thoughts. <laughs> the Iron Suitor, a dance with dragons. The swiftest ships he gave to Red Ralph Stonehouse to sail the Corsairs' road along the northern coast of Sothorius. The dead cities rotting on that fervid, sweltering shore were best avoided, every seaman knew. But in the mud and blood towns of the Basilisk's Isles, teeming with escaped slaves, slavers, skinners, whores, hunters, brindled men, and worse, there were always provisions to be had for men who were not afraid to pay the iron price. This is 30 to 40 ships we're talking about. 
And as Victoria notes earlier in the chapter, only nine of that group of 30 to 40 made it to the rendezvous. This accounts for at least half of Vic's total missing ships. Red Ralph himself didn't make it. This, by the way, I think is a far more plausible explanation than the idea that some of the Iron Fleet defected back to Euron. The dangers in these parts are legion, even for a large group of warrior sailors like the Ironborn. What I'm saying is, maybe those provisions weren't so easy to come by after all, despite what Vic says. Maybe they were struck by some awful diseases. Maybe they went ashore on the mainland despite Victorian thoughts on how everyone knew better not to. Maybe not everyone, after all. Could they have been lured by those tales of riches inland? Red Ralph seemed very loyal to Victorian, but again, he didn't show up. So if his ship sank or he was otherwise killed and his squadron of 30 to 40 ships knew, well, someone had to take over for Red Ralph and that someone may have wanted to cash in on the, on the temptations along this assigned route. Hmm. Once they start doing that, there's any number of things that could go wrong for them, such as being attacked by brindled men who we'll talk about soon or whether them, or Corsairs, or someone, or something else. The point is that the Basilisk Isles are dangerous, even for the Ironborn, even for the Ironborn in force. And though Victorian shows some knowledge of the place, we have to remember something that he doesn't know. In the far north of Westeros, magic has awoken. In the far east, in Karth, we saw the same through Danny's point of view. Magic awakening. People talking about magic awakening. We did an episode on the Comet many years ago, and it is credited by several characters in world as the reason for the rise of magic, or at least the herald of such. Whether that's true doesn't really matter for purposes of this episode. The point is, magic is awoken everywhere as far as we can tell. Should we not assume this applies to Sothorios as well? Yes, I think. Definitely. Since we've seen this magical rising everywhere else, I feel safe in this assumption that it's also happening there. Places we've seen, it's probably happening in places we have not seen, right? Tumco Lowe says there are krakens in the Basilisk Isles, and perhaps the rise of magic increases their activity. I would guess it, it might. Krakens are, are real, though, so they don't, they're not a fantasy creature. Well, the ones this big, I suppose, kind of are. Either way, though, Euron might seek to take advantage of this himself. Right? And all this, it must have been the norm in Nymeria's time as well. What I mean is that magic was a part of the world is a safe assumption back in her time. I mean, we hear of water spouts and an attack wing of 300 dragons. So I think we can assume magic was doing pretty well at that time. So her fleet losing a ship or several to Kraken attacks is certainly possible along the way as well. Maybe it's even likely given so much travel time and so many ships. Indeed, for the Roinar who escaped the devastation of their homeland... They had many more trials to face, starting here in the Basilisk Isles. Dark gods and the sailors who worship them. A bit like Victorian, but with a lot more people. Nymeria apparently had no choice but to stop at the Basilisk Isles for food and water also. Only to fall afoul of the Corsair kings of Axe Isle, Talon, and the Howling Mountain, who put aside their own quarrels long enough to descend upon the Roinar with fire and sword, putting two score ships to the torch, and carrying off hundreds into slavery. In the aftermath, the Corsairs offered to allow the Roinar to settle upon the Isle of Toads, provided they gave up their boats, and sent each king thirty virgin girls and pretty boys each year as tribute. Nymeria refused, and took her fleet to sea once again, hoping to find refuge amongst the steaming jungles of Sothorius. This is their first encounter since fleeing home that we know of, apart from storms and maybe krakens. First encounter with people, is what I should say. And it's a harbinger of things to come throughout their travails. The Roinar are refugees, again. They've lost their institutions and organizations. It's easy to miss just what a mess they'd likely have been. Fleeing in a hurry like they did, families would have been split apart. Strangers would have been forced to live in close quarters with each other on ships that may have been a minor storm away from sinking. By the way, in this context, Corsair and Pirate mean the same thing. As for leadership, even that would be uncertain. Like the Ironborn, I imagine many had the my ship, my rules attitude. Beyond some obvious exceptions like Nymeria herself, people would simply assert themselves on their ships or in their groups of whoever was around them. And that could lead to some bickering, if not outright infighting, especially given all the tension and the fear and all that. And all this is like manna to a gang of pirates. So much weakness and chaos and infighting. Imagine... Nature shows, where lions observe packs of wildebeest. The lions will wait for a weak and or small animal to be separated and grab it quickly before the herd can protect it. 
because these herds defend the smaller ones, usually, right? That's how it works. They position the biggest wildebeest on the outside. It's literally a defensive formation. They know what they're doing. It's a strategy or an evolved strategy. However, these things work in nature. Not so sure Nymeria's people could handle defending themselves as a group like that. These aren't a seafaring people. They're river people. River people in disarray, fleeing from a total loss. Imagine that nature scenario. How easy for the lions when there's no pack. Just a mess. Just a mass. No defensive formation. Just a bunch of ships. That's why the pirates would be salivating when all this came sailing by. That's why they stopped fighting each other temporarily, because all of a sudden there was loot for everyone. I love the Pirate History Podcast. It explains very well how a lot of pirate activity in the Caribbean was rooted in religious disputes, especially Catholic versus Protestant. But these guys, these pirates right here, they mix religion into things in a much more different way. Many of the corsairs cling to the gruesome custom of festooning the hulls and masts of their ships with severed heads to strike fear into their foes. The heads dangle from hemp and rope until all the flesh has rotted off them, whereupon they are replaced with fresh ones. Rather than consign the skulls to the sea, however, the corsairs will deliver them to the skull isle as an offering to some dark god. Thus it is that great piles of yellow skulls can be seen lining the shores of this small, windswept, uninhabited rock. The weary refugee Roinar might have indeed been scared of those severed heads, all the skulls and stuff, but they just faced the prospect of enslavement by Valyria and their dragon. So maybe the skulls were just been like a minor terror by comparison, especially given that enslavement in the mines of Valyria may still have been the end road for many of the Roinar taken by the pirates. Death might seem vastly preferable to that. Again, the freehold is where the pirates sell a lot of their slaves to. Some may have been sold farther away, though. You never know. Prices may have fallen, given the huge influx of Roinar slaves, the whole collapse of a civilization. Eh, pleasant thoughts here. On the plus side, it seems the Roinar must have been able to fight back to some meaningful degree against these pirates, or else there probably wouldn't have been any sort of offer at all. They probably would have kept attacking them and taking what they wanted. And if they were so weak, they wouldn't have been able to just sail off and leave. They wouldn't have been able to escape the Corsairs. So we're going to see Ro Roinar numbers suffer greatly over the course of all these travels, this episode. But this is the beginning when they were at their greatest numbers. So you got to keep that in mind. The idea that the Corsairs were a menace in Nymeria's day is kind of interesting, something we need to look at, given that Valyria was the dominant power in the area. And one might suppose they'd take steps to prevent that, right? And like, what is, why would Valyria want there to be lots of piracy out there? They want trade to work. They want trade to function. They don't want that. In current times, in fact, the Volantines do that. They patrol this area, so it makes sense that the Valyrians would have done so before the Doom. Now Volantis has taken over a lot of that. But even the Valyrians would have had trouble keeping this area safe, given its nature, and given the nature of this place. And we're not told of Valyria as having been a strong sea power. I mean, they were powerful in their own way, because they could afford it and they had dragons, right? That's why they didn't necessarily have a ton of ships, because who's going to send a navy against the team that has all those dragons. That's just suicide. So while we can't assume they had a small navy, it wouldn't be surprising if they did because they didn't necessarily need to worry about being attacked by ships. I think they'd have quite a lot of trade ships, though. And with that comes a greater risk of piracy, especially slave ships. But dragons are not well suited for stopping pirate attacks, right? That's Dragons are much better on the attack than they are on defense. When you don't know where the attack is going to come from, a dragon is only of moderate use. And many dragon lords, let's, you know, think about who they were. These were like the upper, upper, upper crust of a really wealthy, powerful society. I think they would think chasing pirates would be kind of beneath them. I mean, a dragon would be really good at destroying a pirate base as such, you know, if they knew where it was. But the problem is that even when you find it, they just go make another one, as this quote tells us. Port Plunder, the most famous of them, is celebrated in many a song and story, yet cannot be found on any map for the good and sufficient reason that there have been at least a dozen Port Plunders on as many islands. Whenever one is destroyed, another is founded, only to be abandoned in turn. Whatever the reasons, whether my guesses are close or right on or in the neighborhood, the Corsair has definitely been a problem on and off for many eons. 
And whenever something man-made or disease-related comes and kills off large numbers of the pirates, as it did many times over the eons, but we're told every time that happened, new pirates would just come in to replace them. It might take years for that pirate population to rebuild, but it would always happen. In any case, I doubt the Isle of Toads nor any of the Basilisk Isles were seriously considered as a new potential home by Nymeria, but let's take a quick look at the place the Corsairs offered to let them live and why it was not an option. The Toadstone. On the Isle of Toads can be found an ancient idol, a greasy black stone crudely carved into the semblance of a gigantic toad of malignant aspect, some forty feet high. The idea of living with that and giving up some of their own as slaves yearly? This offer was, of course, awful. It was awful. Yet the famous toadstone made of the famous greasy black stone, which we discuss quite a bit in our episodes on Ashai and the Great Empire of the Dawn, it's a great example because it's certainly a representation of a dark god, but the only we get an image or likeness of. The rest are just left to be mysterious. This is a reference to the god Sathagua, created by Clark Ashton Smith for H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. Lovecraft himself used this being, which is indeed toad-like in The Whisperer in Darkness, as one of the Old Ones. Capital letters, Old Ones. Robert E. Howard, whose influence on the world building in this episode is pretty significant, I'd think, also uses a toad-like deity in his story, The Black Stone, which is also a story George R. R. Martin gives a nod to in Constructing the High Tower, which has black stone on its foundation. In this case, the Robert E. Howard story, there's this toad sitting on top of an altar, not unlike this statue. Now, of course, Nymeria didn't know any of those writers, <laughs> but a 40-foot greasy black stone toad idol is a pretty easy nope, even without the backstory. And there are the natives, who apparently the Roinar would have had to share the isle with. Yeah, this is the one place we hear about natives still existing in the basilisks. And they're... Yeah, they're creepy. The Roinar played at dressing up like fish a bit with their scale armor and used that turtle shell shield, etc. But there are some people, I use the term lightly, who have that built in. The people of this isle are believed by some to be descended from those who carved the toadstone, for there is an unpleasant fish-like aspect to their faces, and many have webbed hands and feet. If so, they are the sole surviving remnant of this forgotten race. This description is seen elsewhere in Martin's world, such as among some of the sister men, like House Borel, that we see through Davos' point of view, and certain ironborn bloodlines like the aptly named House Cod. Hmm, puns. This is also H.P. Lovecraft influence, particularly the tale The Shadow Over Innsmouth. So maybe these should be the Lovecraft Isles instead of the Basilisk Isles, or the Cthulhu Isles. The Cods would hear the call and come live there. The Cod of Cthulhu. Daenerys, too, will have the Ironborn among her people, it seems. Surely she won't take their ships and kill all the sailors. Might be a few members of House Cod and her navy in due course, too. And Daenerys, Khaleesi, is no stranger to idols and bizarre gods, right? Nor depictions of the twisted creations made by those gods and by men with the darkest of purposes. In Ves Dothrak, she saw them all. Salador San's ancestor, Sathos San, was once sent to join a free city's fleet to clear pirates from the Basilisk Isles. But instead, he made himself king of the Basilisk Isles, and he ruled for 30 years. He's the only person we know of to do that. Salador names one of his own ships Sathosan, but it sinks off the Grey Cliffs when sailing from Eastwatch by the sea. The worst of men. Doesn't it just figure that the continent with the greatest of natural horrors is also where humanity does its worst deeds? We've listed a whole lot of both, from deadly creatures, to deadly diseases, to deadly everything. Deadly weather, even. Piracy and murder are nothing compared to this meaning wyverns and basilisks and even, well, most of the diseases are preferable fates to that. Thousands of years ago, nearly five from A Song of Ice and Fire and about four from the time of the 10,000 ships, the Giscari founded a city on the Isle of Tears, which is the largest of the basilisk isles. The city was called Gorgai. Now, given that the Giscari were interested in slavery, mostly, it seems likely that was what they had in mind by building this city here. But given the exotic things found in the area... There's probably other uses for it as well. Trade, of course. Even if the slave trade dominated, there would be other things to trade as well. Now, this may be how the world eventually learned that the native Sathorii make poor slaves. And I'll tell you that. The native Sathorii make poor slaves. According to 
the Giscari, who know such things. The Valyrians agree with them, who also know such things. But as the fighting pits remind us, those who see human and human-like races as goods, as chattel, know there are other options besides straight slavery when it comes to captives. If you can't tame them, it's usually because they're too wild, which in turn makes them candidates for the arena, where wild, savage violence earns large profits through eager crowds. We're told that after perhaps two or four hundred years, the Valyrians conquered Gorgai and renamed it Gagasus. They, of course, were highly interested in slavery as well, but it's said they used it as a penal colony instead. Gagasus would be in Valyrian hands for maybe as long as 3,000 years. I would guess, given the nature of Valyria's society, that a lot of the criminals would be enslaved. But the Valyrians took the concept of other options for captives besides slavery to a whole new and horrific level. Not that the Giscari wouldn't have been willing to take this step. It's just that they couldn't, because this new level the Valyrians took things to is blood magic, which the Giscari didn't have. The Rhoynar may not have been well aware of this city, or I'm not so sure they'd have moved so close to it. It would be too easy for Lyria to, to find them again, right? But perhaps the city was smaller then, or more remote than the distance would make it seem. It's not clear. Still, having something called flesh pits next door, you're going to have a bad time. And it's worse when you learn what it really means. It appears to mean a place where new species were created, where mismatched species were forcibly bred, and magic was used somehow to facilitate all that, and to make it a lot more scary when we talk about it. So not only does Sothorius offer the worst of the natural world on Planetos, it manages to offer the worst of humanity in the unnatural world via magic. This is something I consider a much larger topic. And thus I've moved most of my notes and thoughts to another episode script, which we'll release as a bonus episode sometime. In that episode, we'll discuss what we know about Gagasus' flesh pits, the blood magic used to create these engineered sphinxes, and what we know might have been done to them, or at least guess what might have been done to them, and where they are now. Sphinxes, dragons, even lizard lions, we have ideas with clues not only from A Song of Ice and Fire, but tidbits I picked up from his tough voyaging short stories and other places. So keep your eyes peeled for the announcement on that one. It's too long for this episode, and the Roynar don't interact with it directly enough for it to fit here. But it's cool, so I'll be keeping you all up to date on the progress with that. For now, let's take our mid-roll break. If you haven't purchased Fire and Blood yet, why not head over to historyofwesteros.com and use our Amazon links to purchase it. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and it supports the show. While you're there, you can look into Kindle memberships or Amazon Prime TV, which we use here at our house, or subscriptions to Audible through Amazon. You get two free downloads if you join and take a trial membership, and you don't have to pay anything. You can decide not to keep the subscription and keep those two free book downloads. Again, all of these things are available at historyofwesteros.com. Thanks to our blood riders, Vorsaki, wielder of a Valyrian steel arak with a dragon bone hilt, and Koal Koei, called Sunpiercer, wielder of a dragon bone bow. This time, let's give shoutouts to our northern champions, Jay Wilson, Winter's King, Sir Stephen, the Hammer of the North, Winter's King, Lord of the First Men, Lady Ar Ardross, Mother of Wolves, Sir Brian the Return, Knight of the Last House, wielder of the Valyrian steel blade Red Song. Sir Kobe of House Stonesmith, words are wind, deeds are stone. Lady Cat Jones of the Big Pond, wielder of the Valyrian steel blade, Ginger's Honor. Jake Snow, a.k.a. Jacob Ice Eyes, the Bastard of the Last River. Lord Darren of House Rambler, the last hunt is ceaseless. And Lady Bobby of House Mitchell. To Sothorius. Men have known of the existence of the vast, savage land to the south since the first of them took to the sea in ships, for only the width of the summer sea separates Athorius from the ancient civilizations and great cities of Essos and Westeros. The Giscari established outposts on its northern shores in the days of the old empire. They raised the walled city Zamatar at the mouth of the river Zamoyos and built the grim, penal colony Gorosh on Wyvern Point. Carthine adventurers, hungry for profit, sought gold, gems, and ivory along the eastern coasts of Sothorius. Summer islanders did the same in the west. The freehold of Illyria thrice established colonies on Basilisk Point. The first was destroyed by the brindled men, the second lost to plague, and the third was abandoned when the dragon lords captured Zamatar in the Fourth Giscari War. Yet we cannot claim to know Sothorius well. Its interior remains a mystery to us, covered by impenetrable jungle, where ancient cities full of ghosts lie in ruins beside great sluggish rivers. So a brief recap. 
After Garen's death, Nymeria leads a ragged band of refugees, all the while being kind of stubborn about the fact that she herself is a refugee too, which serves her people well, but it's a tough spot. She leaves certain death behind for the unknown. The sea is vast and stormy, and many are lost on the way to, well, the unknown. You know what they say. One Roinar's vast sea is another Kalasar's grass sea. Okay, no, they, meaning me. I'm the only one who says that. And I'll probably never say it again. <laughs> so compare that to just after Drogo's death. Danny gathers her ragged band, a lot more ragged than Nymeria's, but the idea is the same. Her Kalsar is mostly made up of a people who aren't exactly known for their worldliness either, right? A people who mostly stay in their native environment. And immediately she heads to the Red Waste, a desert so vast and harsh that many didn't survive the journey. Instead of dying at sea, dying on a desert. Now, you can starve to death and run out of fresh water on the open sea just like you can in a desert. It's more similar than you might think. She had no maps. Danny, that is. Just Jorah's notion that there were cities somewhere to the east. Yeah, isn't that kind of funny? The trip planner for this whole scenario is the knight from Bear Island. <laughs> this is the guy that they're listening to for where to go in Essos, right? The Roinar probably had some maps. They did a lot of trading and all, right? That, that had to come up at some point, and they had plenty of wealth. So picking a spot where there wasn't a lot of people made a lot of sense, especially if they didn't know better because of their inward facingness. Because the map is not the land, right? We've heard that phrase in Song of Ice and Fire. It doesn't tell you about the people or things or diseases or stories. It only gives you the terrain. And even the maps were probably wrong at this point. The World of Ice and Fire tells us that the Giscari, the Valyrians, the Carthine, the Summer Islanders all had different notions of how large the place is or was. Although they do all agree it's huge. That's about it. <laughs> Neither Danny's Kalsar nor Nymeria's Roinar really knew what they were getting into, but they figured that, surely... The unknown had to be better than the known. Not so fast. Sothurios would make many rethink that certainty. And since the Roinar will interact with many locations around Sothurios, let's talk about some of the recurring features of the realm, starting with the locals. It's fairly well known that Bravos was founded by a group of fugitive slaves taken by the freehold of Valyria. Not so well known is that this convoy of slave ships was already supposed to found a colony, but instead of in Bravos, it was intended for Sothorios. Maybe the thought of having to live down there was the extra motivation that they needed to rebel. The old man and the wyvern. Huge crocodiles lurk beneath the surface of the Zamoyos and have been known to overturn boats swimming up from below so they might devour their occupants as they struggle in the water. Other streams are infested by swarms of carnivorous fish capable of stripping the flesh from a man's bones in minutes. There are stinging flies, venomous snakes, wasps, and worms that lay their eggs beneath the skins of horses, hogs, and men alike. The Zamoyos. That's the primary river in Sothorios, and think of that in comparison to what we quoted about Mother Roin last episode. <laughs> sure, there were a few dangers. Some of the turtles. They could get real nasty. But compared to this... Eee, what a difference. Not close. Perspective comes up big again here, as it's going to a lot. The pain of flight here would be traumatic. Then you have the trauma of replacing it day to day with this. And of course there are worse things. Of course there are. This is George R. R. Martin. Not only is there the Basilisk Isles, which don't really have basilisks anymore, but there's Basilisk Point, which does. A basilisk in Martin's world is an ugly, fierce, terrifying reptilian-type creature that Ranges in size from a small dog to twice the size of a lion. And they're venomous. What? On top of that, the substance Jack and Hagar uses to get Weiss's dog to attack Weiss, turning on his own master and killing him? Basilisk blood. You can see why these were mostly or entirely wiped off the islands. Everything about them is dangerous to humans. But such is impossible on the mainland, or even in the region of Basilisk Point, apparently. Is jungles. How are you going to wipe out a species that lives deep in the jungles like this? It's just not feasible. In the real world, there are still tribes deep in the Amazon rainforest who have never had contact with the outside world. Let that sink in when you think about Sothorios. It seems a lot more realistic in that mind. That's, what, that's just how jungles are. It's just crazy what you can hide inside a jungle. And George knows this. He likes to take the craziest real-world stuff and give it fantasy amplification. Famplification. Instead of tribes, in this case, or rather, in addition to tribes, there are surely countless other species and creatures unnamed and undocumented deep in Sothorios. But in particular, we should talk about the wyverns, which in Martin's world are essentially dragons, but hungrier and often meaner. 
but smaller and without fire breathing. We first see them sculpted on Dragonstone, but as for real ones, they come in a wide variety of colors and sizes, each cooler than the rest. Well, not from the Roinar perspective. More like each is more terrifying than the rest to them. Think about that for a minute. The Roinar could handle Valyrian soldiers and sorcerers. They were able to win the wars against them. It was the dragons that came in and made the difference and turned the tides and caused them to lose. And here they are moving to a place that had creatures awfully similar. That's not going to make for peaceful sleep at night. Maybe they were hoping that wyverns didn't like large groups of people, or that they lived further inland. But I think of Hazea, the young girl killed by Drogon, who the Giscari have taken to calling the Winged Shadow. And notice that one of the nastier wyverns is black and nicknamed the Shadow Wing. So... Well, those are the scariest, apparently, but not the most dangerous. Some wyverns are brindled, some like swamps, some like jungles. The shadow wings like hunting at night, and some like hunting in packs, and those are the most dangerous. Yeah, things that hunt in packs are almost always up there among the nastiest creatures there are. And well, we got more of that. Germ orcs. No, not germ orcs, as in plague orcs or bacteria orcs, but the orcs of George R. R. Martin. You didn't miss the term appearing. He didn't ever use the word orc. The term isn't, doesn't appear in A Song of Ice and Fire or The World of Ice and Fire. Instead, he just gives it a different name. Brindled men. The Sathori are big-boned creatures, massively muscled, with long arms, sloped foreheads, huge squarish teeth, heavy jaws, and coarse black hair. Their broad, flat noses suggest snouts, and their thick skins are brindled in patterns of brown and white that seem more hog-like than human. Sathori women cannot breed with any, save their own males. When mated with men from Essos or Westeros, they bring forth only stillbirths, many hideously malformed. So there we have snouts and the word hog-like, plus a lot of other fairly typical orc features. The only other time the word brindled appears in A Song of Ice and Fire besides with the wyverns is House Kraykal's sigil, which just so happens to be a brindled boar. Despite the Roinar's lack of experience abroad in the wider world, they'd learn a few things from the wider world coming to them, right? It's the biggest river in the world, full of trading opportunity. It's hospitable, and it's a nice place to be. So, uh, as we know, the Roinar traders and craftsmen would be a draw as well. Lots of reasons to go there and trade. So through trade, they'd have met most of these peoples of the world. But not all the people of the world travel, so they wouldn't have met those. And the native Sathorii are a good example of that. They don't travel. They only show a few signs of rudimentary civilization. They don't build much or at all. And most relevantly, how much contact the Roinar had with them prior to the Exodus? Well, since they don't go to sea, probably very little or none. But incursions, adventurers, and colonists of Giscari, Valyrian, Carthine, and Summer Islander, and other origins seem to have created a small population of outwardly facing locals. The Sathori that dwell closest to the sea have learned to speak the trade talk. The Giscari consider them too slow of wit to make good slaves, but they are fierce fighters. Farther south, the trappings of civilization fall away, and the brindled men become ever more savage and barbaric. These Sathori worship dark gods with obscene rites. Many are cannibals and more are ghouls. When they cannot feast upon the flesh of foes and strangers, they eat their own dead. This quote seems to reflect current times, meaning a song of ice and fire current. And perhaps there were huge differences compared to Nymeria's day, but probably not, considering many of the races have been coming to Sathorios for eons. I suppose the dark gods and obscure rites are even worse than those of the Basilisk Isles? And well, if these gods are pro-cannibalism and ghoul... Ism ghoulery? I don't know. Well, whatever. It's definitely not as bad as slavery if we're getting technical, but it is way creepier and makes collecting skulls look like collecting shells. Cannibalism in the North seems largely to be a product of deprivation, a food source used as a last resort. There's exceptions, but that's like maybe the Skagosi. And it's hard not to think of this topic in A Song of Ice and Fire without thinking of the Skagosi and some of the other examples of cannibalism around the world. With the Kogosi, religion may play a role in their cannibalism, and it may as well for the brindled men. But not all cannibalism is a matter of needing to eat. Some just do it. And there are other examples of cannibalism around Planetos, but we just don't have a lot of detail on those. We just have the names and the, the basic thoughts. And maybe that's for the best. <laughs> 
But Bran may have eaten Jojen to gain powers. And maybe the dark gods of Sothorios promise powers to certain of their worshippers if a similar cost is paid. Hmm. Magic has a cost in Martin's world. But as that quote reveals, not all Sothorii are of this ilk, or at least they don't seem to be, since they set up spots to trade with outsiders and presumably don't eat them. Bad business to eat your customers. I would think considerable profit could be had via these simple trading locales. After all, the brindled men don't seem to have smiths and forges, so good steel weapons and tools are likely to be fairly prized, like they are amongst the wildlings. Plenty of cheap foods and drinks and alcohol would also be something that the Sothorii might have a consistent demand for. Send us food, or we'll have to eat each other, basically. <laughs> or you. A story set in Sothorios could show us Natives with a smattering of manufactured goods from a variety of cultures around the world. Some traded for, some taken by force. When Ashea made her pitch video for a Nymeria TV show, which you should check out, by the way, if you haven't seen, she envisioned an old smith teaching a young girl smith, partly because most of the Roinar left alive were women and the elderly. Those characters would have a lot of screen time in this part of the story here in Sithorios. And perhaps the natives don't put the same value on many of the items humankind desires. Perhaps they didn't care about gold or gems or certain rare spices. That was the case here in the U.S. Native Americans never really understood why the, in, the immigrating uh, Americans from, who call themselves Americans now, the Europeans immigrating to America, why? They never understood why they valued gold so much. They called it the metal that the yellow metal that drives humans mad, or not humans, but that drives the white people mad. So uh, it seems like a little bit of that element's taking, it might be in play in Sithorios. So their lack of interest in certain goods, as valuable as it may be as a trade goal, is paired with their ability to survive the many deadly features of Sithorios. The natives know the other natives and local creatures far better than any foreigner could ever hope to, well, at least not likely to, let alone their knowledge of the land itself, but it goes even beyond that as well. Just think of immunity, right? If you grow up on a continent with these diseases, you're going to be a little more immune to the, uh, the effects of them. Just like when the Europeans came to America, the diseases they brought with them helped wipe out a lot of the natives because the immune systems hadn't gotten used to that. This is the same concept. Now, a wyvern probably doesn't discriminate between brindled men and regular men, but it's not the large creatures we're worried about anyway. It's these small ones, the diseases, so the meaning really, really small. A pit fighter named the Brindled Butcher, presumably a native Sothorii, is freed along with all the other slaves in Marine. He is the only brindled man we know of, assuming he actually is one. The nickname could be misleading. Either way, there's a good chance we see him in action during the upcoming Battle of Fire, which we did an episode on years ago. If we see the Brindled Butcher, it'll most likely be from Barristan's point of view, but we could also see him through Tyrion's or Victorian's. A plague of plagues. Among these somewhat civilized Brindled men who trade with humankind, their presumed immunity, partial or full, to the vast range of pestilences that infect Sothorios is not to be understated. Humans trading near to the sea is better for everyone involved. The natives bring the goods. The humans are minimally exposed to the really small killers, the diseases. Otherwise, you'd have many people traveling to Sothorius to obtain wealth through trade or otherwise. But then they'd have to return to civilization to sell these treasures and trade goods, possibly carrying with them some hideous, possibly spreadable infection. Tyrion 10, A Dance with Dragons. What's the master like? Penny asked anxiously. His eyes are yellow and he stinks, said Sweets. Ten years ago he went to Sothorius and he has been rotting from the inside out ever since. Make him forget that he's dying even for a little while, and he can be most generous. Deny him nothing. The master, Yezan Zokegaz, a.k.a. the Yellow Whale, given his penchant for collecting exotic living creatures, that's probably why he went to Sothorios, and he paid the price. Yezan is quite a symbol. Ultra-rich, ultra-depraved, at the pinnacle of a rotten culture, as beyond saving as he is. In his case, he doesn't appear to be contagious, but there would be cases that were. That can cause all kinds of problems, especially diseases that don't manifest symptoms quickly, you know? 
dormant diseases that pop up later after they've spread. That's really bad. And there's a number of stories in the Song of Ice and Fire regarding diseases entering a population center via a ship at port, like the tale of the Grey Plague at Old Town that Pycelle tells to Ned early in A Game of Thrones, or the other one where Illyrio tells Tyrion regarding Sarah's death by, also, the Grey Plague. Last episode, we discussed Grayscale quite a bit and how we think it'll be a significant plot point. We've also already seen Daenerys and Tyrion deal with plague in Slaver's Bay, the Pale Mare, which managed to finish off the Yellow Whale before the uh, other disease did. What a risk for him to have taken, because I think the Giscari would know better. I'm, I'm referring to Yezan's okay guys here. I think they did know. The Giscari founded the first colony ever in Sothorios that's known. And more afterwards, they are or were surely aware that Sothorios goes hard in the disease category. Blood boils, green fever, sweet rot, bronze pate, the red death, grey scale, brown leg, worm bone, sailor's bane, pus eye, and yellow gum are only a few of the diseases found here, many so virulent that they have been known to wipe out whole settlements. Archmaster Ebro's study of centuries of travellers' accounts suggests that nine of every ten men visiting Sathorius from Westeros will suffer one or more of these afflictions, and that almost half will die. Only a few, it says. Wipe out whole settlements, it says. Nine out of ten afflicted, half of those dead, it says. So about 4.5 out of ten who visit die, it means. Just visiting triggers that percentile dice check. 45%. Let's say the Archmaster is way off. Let's say he's wrong. Let's say his perspective is bad. Let's, and let's say he's tripled the odds. That's still a 15% chance of just going there. Dying from disease. And we're not even counting the other dangers. So, eesh. still though. The Roinar will eventually leave, and I'm not sure that almost half of them all died. So that's why I'm kind of questioning these numbers. So maybe the maesters are wrong based on that. Or maybe the Roiner had something, something magical or smarter ideas about sanitation, something to keep the disease from getting such as a bad thing as it could be. Or both. Maybe they had several measures against that. Either way, it's quite a thing to be able to avoid. And if so, well, we may get more clues later. Or maybe they really did lose almost half their number to disease. <laughs> we'll keep our options open as we move on to the first Roiner settlements. And remember what we've seen with regards to fear and disease. The perspective we've been given is that many brave warriors are not so brave when faced with disease. So how anxious would that make a person living in this new realm, knowing that the next drink of water they take could be diseased? The next breath they take could be toxic. Sounds like hell. And well, it almost is. Just north of hell. So take all these awful, dangerous people living in the basilisks and realize that they don't live on the main continent. They're the reason the isles are so dangerous for the most part, but even they don't want to mess with what's just down south. And that's despite this. There are riches hidden amongst the jungles and swamps and sullen, sun-baked rivers of the south, beyond a doubt. But for every man who finds gold or pearls or precious spices... There are a hundred who find only death. The fact that the pirates steer clear of the deep jungles tells you something. They want money, but they don't want to pay that price to get it. They seem to agree with the maesters. The Roinar, for whatever reasons, were game to try, however. Maybe it was part desperation, maybe part ignorance. Maybe they thought their water wizards and technology gave them a path to colonization that others lacked. And thinking this through, it's not as if no one at all lives there. As we're told... Quote, a score of small trade towns cling to the northern coast. The corsairs of the Basilisk Isles prey upon these settlements, carrying off captives to holding pens on Talon and the Isle of Tears before selling them to the flesh markets of Slaver's Bay or the pillow houses and pleasure gardens of Lys. And the native races grow ever more savage and primitive the farther one travels from the coasts. So unlike the jungles, these... The pirates are willing to target the people, but probably not those more savage and primitive ones inland. Just these coastal ones. We can only wonder whether these existed in Nymeria's day. I would guess yes. What a sight for those locals to see so many new neighbors moving in, though. That would be odd. Though there were exceptions and smaller communities, there were three primary locations on the mainland that the Roinar aimed for. 
Some settled on Basilisk Point, others beside the glistening green waters of the Zamoyos, amongst quicksands, crocodiles, and rotting, half-drowned trees. Princess Nymeria herself remained with the ships at Zamatar, a Giscari colony abandoned for a thousand years, whilst others made their way upriver to the Cyclopean ruins of Yeen, haunt of ghouls and spiders. Settling in an abandoned colony keeps us well in sync with Daenerys, whose first stop after the Red Waste was Vice Taloro. Of course, Danny saw it as a temporary base of operations, while Nymeria was hopeful that her people could stay for the long term. Still, the parallel is pretty strong. The Zamoyos River would seem to be the best destination given the need for fresh water, and there are no other visible rivers shown to us. There's probably some smaller ones that just don't appear in the map. Still, some people chose a spot not on the Zamoyos River, which is maybe a bit unusual for the Roinar, and definitely worth a look. So let's start with them. Basilisk Point. Long before any of us were born, our shared ancestors all around the globe, hunted the most dangerous animals to extinction while domesticating the useful and friendly ones. They battled diseases, invented essential tools we now take for granted, explored unexplored lands, and dealt with fear of kinds we no longer face now. A lot of that fear of the unknown. Ancestors of the Roinar did the same, but now this generation was starting that process all over, especially the ones here on Basilisk Point. In Zamatar and Yin, they had ancient ruins to repurpose. There's at least some structures to reuse, but the Basilisk Point Roinar appear to have been starting mostly from scratch. Again, there's no visible river on Basilisk Point, but there had to be some kind of water source or it just wouldn't have been livable at all. In my neighborhood, a chief concern is termites, <laughs> like it is in a lot of neighborhoods. That's one of the biggest enemies of homeowners around the world. This group moved from a now beautiful, idyllic river situation best in the world to having to live in a place named after huge, angry, poisonous reptiles. Unlike the Basilisk Isles, where there are no actual basilisks, they do exist in this area. And remember what we told you about how nasty they are. <laughs> at least they didn't choose to live at Wyvern Point, am I right? No, really, that is a place too. It's Gaskari built a colony called Gorosh there, and it didn't go well. We can only wonder if the Roinar knew much of the other failed colonies in this area apart from their ruins. Not only is there this question of choosing to live amongst these beasts, but also why did this group of settlers choose to live so far from the other Roinar settlements? It could be the simplest of all explanations, that stubborn Roinar independence. Because I do think that it wouldn't have been a space issue. As we'll see, Zamatar is particularly large, at least it seems to be. But maybe we're underestimating the size of the number of Roinar. So this is kind of a mystery. Either way, it's not hard to imagine that within the Roinar there was a faction who chafed under Nymeria's rule. Even if she was doing a good job, there's just always someone that thinks they can do better, right? Perhaps believing the new circumstances granted them the right to do things differently too. Like, hey, this isn't the Roin. Why are we bound by the laws we followed there? This is a whole new society we're building. There would be people that, you know, found ways to work around what was there. You know, lots of uh, new lawyers <laughs> coming up with new interpretations of old situations. Just like it was for the Corsairs, the chaos and confusion and fear is also an opportunity, though. Given time, the new princes and princesses of Basilisk Point, I guess that's what they'd be, after coming up with a suitably artsy new name for the area, they'd probably have named it something. They are not down with Basilisk, let's be honest. I doubt they wanted to call it Basilisk Point. Anyway, they could challenge Nymeria for supremacy of the Roinar in time. They, again, <laughs> people are always playing the Game of Thrones. But if it went well enough, that's the thing. Over time, this would be an option. It certainly wouldn't be right away. And of course, this would not be the dream of the vast majority of the commoners and even most of the nobles. We're talking about exceptions here. Most would just be probably wanting to build towards a new future. They'd all agree, at least, that the return to prosperity in any form would be a huge improvement. They'd clear back large sections of jungle, build villages that could grow into towns and maybe cities, and one day, maybe, return to Mother Roin? That was probably the plan, or at least the plan of a lot of them. That, most of all, well, revenge, yes, they want that, but returning home, that would be the primary dream, I think. Remember now, even currently, we have Roinar bred and born in Dorne, 
who want to go to Mother Ruin. Yandri and Yasilla, we saw in the last episode. That's exactly what they did. They were born in Dorne, but they felt the call and moved back to Mother Ruin, despite the dangers. Earlier, we spoke of how the portion of the Iron Fleet that passed through here apparently fared poorly, with 20 to 30-ish ships unaccounted for. Think of that while also pondering Euron's claims that he's been all over the world. You're on Greyjoy at the Basilisk Isles? Or, hey, if he can go to Valyria, why not Sothorios too? Zamatar. Of past attempts to settle in Sothorios, it's said in the world of Ice and Fire. Colonies planted here wither and die. Only Zamatar endured for more than a generation. And today, even that once great city is a haunted ruin, slowly being reclaimed by the jungle. Well... That doesn't sound great, even if it does sound better than the other options. Yeah. Compare that to what we heard last episode. Quote, elegant cities, each lovelier than the last. If we're continuing to think about perspective, then we can't miss that this is a serious downgrade. They were so used to so much better, and more importantly, perhaps, so much safer. Still, unlike Basilisk Point in our next topic, Yin, I could see why Zamatar might have worked as a colony. Those other two? Nope. I really don't, I don't see how Basil's Point or Yin could have ever worked, to be honest. Uh, but I don't have all the information. Still, let me explain why I think Zamatar could have worked. There's a good bit of mystery around Zamatar, but it appears to have been a successful colony for at least some bit of time. And that some bit of time could be centuries, or it could be even longer. It could only be like 40 to 50 years. But I lean towards the longer time frame, because it was built by the Giscari before the Third Giscari War, and then captured by Valyria during the Fourth Giscari War. So it lasted at least the span of those two wars, plus however long Valyria had it before they left it. And we don't know why they left it. So there's part of the mystery. They, maybe they abandoned it right away. Maybe they had it for a long time. Maybe they had it for many centuries. And it wouldn't be called great if it just barely hung on for a while, right? That's, it would never have been great if it was just barely surviving. So the next question we should ask is, what made it great? Well, we have that whole mouth of the river thing going for it, right? It's less valuable in this kind of circumstance because there's not cities or people upriver to be sending trade goods downstream. But in time, Zamatar could have become the center of something big. That's probably what Valyria and Giscari culture both wanted. But instead of the center, they became the whole thing because nothing else seemed to work. Zamatar is a walled city. That's also likely part of why it survived. It's a huge help in keeping out like brindled men and nasty creatures. Wouldn't stop a wyvern, but wyvern might not want to come into a city. Still, those walls were probably initially intended to keep in slaves, but walls are doubly useful like that, aren't they? They may have been able to import food from Essos in ancient times, right? Because it's a colony from a larger empire. The Roynar would not have been able to do that, though. Or at least they would have had a really hard time doing that. Uh, I'm guessing it wasn't possible at all. Still, there is the possibility of trade with the locals. Whatever good that would do them. In terms of food, I'm not sure. Earlier we mentioned how finished trade goods, especially tools and weapons, were and are likely to be valued by the natives given their limited capacity to, well, make things on their own. Consider that in the light of the notable skills possessed by the Roinar in that regard. Perhaps that was one of the draws for them to come to Zathoris in the first place. They're like, look, our craftsmanship is going to be able to trade really well down there. Yeah. It's true that this likely applies to all the Roinar settlements, but I would think Zamatar would be the primary trade spot given its location. Though it may not have been in the past, Zamatar was in the center of the new Roinar collective here, right? Because there was a settlement in Basilisk Point, and it would be only a couple of days or so sail to the west, and Yin would be even closer downriver. It's also said that they stored their so-called 10,000 ships here, kind of showing that they considered it the center of their new Roinish Confederacy of Sothorios, I'll call it. And it's of major importance that Nymeria chose to make her seat here as well. That's very relevant to the issue of governess in this new uh, situation here. And she, again, wasn't married. She's going to be three times, in fact. But all the three of those come after she arrives in Dorne. So at this point, she was likely still getting bombarded by offers, though probably less than there would have been because there's so few men. She might have had offers from Corsairs, or natives from the Basilisk, maybe even from Gagasos. There's another quick nope, though. <laughs> even though she didn't marry, maybe some of the other Roinar mingled with the locals themselves. It's likely, in fact. But we also read that the Sothorii can't breed with humans. We don't know about the other way around so much. 
Uh, and the same thing is said about breeding with the Ibanez. And that's up for debate. That's why I challenge the maesters on this. Because the maesters say, no, you can't breed with the Ibanez. But Brown Ben Plum says one of his ancestors is from Ibs. So, I don't know. I'm pretty sure Zach from Game of Owns is also part Ibish, but keep that on the down low. Setting all that aside, all these Roinar were desperate, but also brave. Choosing Sartorios was bold, even, even if they were ignorant of some of its features. And they might not have been. That's just one possibility. There's an argument to be made, however, that some were braver than others. The bravest group of Rhinar may have been those who settled deepest in the jungles, closest to the unknown. What with the Red Common and the return of dragons and the others, it's clear magic is on the rise in Westeros and Essos. So, why not Sothorios too? Are the dark gods of the brindled men whispering to their shamans? What old powers are awakening in those endless, teeming jungles? Since magic was active during Nymeria's time, keep it in mind during this next section. Yeen. The third of the settlements after Zamatar and Basilisk Point is one we've already discussed, not in this episode, but in our Great Empire of the Dawn episode with LML. Shout out to Lucifer Means Lightbringer, because that is now our most watched episode of all time. Great Empire of the Dawn. Cool, huh? So here at Yeen, deepest in the jungle, closest to the mysteries, we'd expect, well, the worst. Expect the worst, yeah. The city has nope written all over it, and I really don't know what the Roy and I were thinking. Maybe it was that whole bit about trying to impress their beautiful princess with extreme bravery. A whole colony of such types, perhaps. <laughs> or maybe it was that Roinar independence thing on steroids. They, they didn't want to live with Nymeria. They wanted to do, you know, be under their own control or, or something. It's hard to say. These guesses don't feel all that satisfying, though. Because Nymeria herself is said to have considered it evil. Maesters and other scholars alike have puzzled over the greatest of the enigmas of Sothorius, the ancient city of Yin, a ruin older than time built of oily black stone in massive blocks so heavy that it would require a dozen elephants to move them. Yin has remained a desolation for many thousands of years, yet the jungle that surrounds it on every side has scarce touched it. A city so evil that even the jungle will not enter, Nymeria is supposed to have said when she laid eyes on it, if the tales are true. Every attempt to rebuild or resettle Yin has ended in horror. Ended in horror. Yeah, like I said, expect the worst, right? Nymeria herself called it evil, yet clearly people lived there, so, I don't know. I believe this shows the nature of her rulership here, which is that her people were basically free to leave her at any time, I seriously doubt the city she called evil was a place she recommended other people live. So I'm guessing some faction, some family, or even a strong singular leader, perhaps, just picked this spot and others followed. Um, despite whatever hesitation others had, some clearly did it. Maybe they looked at the jungle and how it wouldn't grow into the city and thought that a convenience instead of a bad, bad sign of what it does to life. And there's a lot to remind us here of Ashai. The greasy black stones of gigantic size, like really gigantic, don't forget. The lack of plant life, the wealth nearby, but the area around Ashai is, while mysterious, pretty dead. The shadow, right? Yin itself is a dead zone too, but it's surrounded by jungles teeming with life. Life that will kill you. A fun question here is, did the Giscari founder Zamatar try to settle Yin as well? Did they see it like Nymeria did? A big nope? A big evil? Same question for the Valyrians who took over Zamatar. What was their relationship to Yin? Did they try to settle it? We're not sure where the equator on Planetos is, but it probably is nearby given how hot it is and how hot it was in Valyria and say Dorne is now. Maybe it starts to get cooler down near Yin. Maybe. Maybe it's even hotter. But, and if it is, that's bad, but also would make it like, geez, why did anyone want to live there if it's also hotter? Because if it was cooler there, if it had slightly better weather, then maybe that's something that would make Yin less terrible than the other Roinar colonies. I mean, it's deeper in the jungle, deeper into the unexplored. Or as we heard earlier, the more dangerous creatures live and where the brindled men are more savage. This is bad. <laughs> Back on the Roin, the worst thing is the stone men, and those didn't even exist yet at this time, given Garen's curse had just occurred. And besides... They're not even near as terrifying than, than the things that happened down here, even with Grayscale included, because the diseases of Sothorios are far worse, and Grayscale is one of them anyway. Yeah, there's Grayscale and Sothorios too. And the area a bit south of Yin is called 
The Green Hill. Not exactly a name that suggests this southern area is cooler, right? I mean, temperature-wise. So hell doesn't make it sound cooler. It sounds hotter, even. Earlier, we mentioned the giant apes who can kill elephants with a punch. What? But still, even they apparently live north of Green Hell, but south of Yin, where even worse things live. Even worse things. <laughs> There, if the tales are to be trusted, are caverns full of pale white vampire bats who can drain the blood from a man in minutes. Tattooed lizards stalk the jungles, running down their prey and ripping them apart with the long, curved claws on their powerful hind legs. Snakes fifty feet long slither through the underbrush, and spotted spiders weave their webs amongst the great trees. The maesters acknowledge that these are tales, and perhaps not to be trusted fully, but like it is with the disease statistics, even if you take these tales down a notch or three, they are still scary. It's suggested that wyverns are most common in this area, perhaps excepting Wyvern Point, and the Roinar and Ying seem to be the most likely to have encountered them. However, the greatest danger was likely the brindled men, as we see here, where we also see it wasn't going well in any of the colonies. There were riches to be found in Sothorius. Gold, gems, rare woods, exotic pelts, queer fruits, and strange spices. But the Roinar did not thrive there. The sullen, wet heat oppressed their spirits, and swarms of stinging flies spread one disease after another. Green fever, the dancing plague, blood boils, weeping sores, sweet rot. The young and very old proved especially vulnerable to such contagions, even to splash in the river was to court death, for the Zamoyos was infested with schools of carnivorous fish and tiny worms that laid their eggs in the flesh of swimmers. Two of the new towns on Basilisk Point were raided by slavers, their entire populace put to the sword or carried off in chains, whilst Yeen had to contend with attacks from the brindled ghouls of the jungle deeps. And that last bit is actually another reason why Yeen might have seemed preferable. It was out of reach of the slavers for the most part, but how terrible that must have been. The Roinar had seen too much slavery, and one can only imagine that since some of these were probably sold to Valyria, they were taunted, probably, by the slavers for being caught eventually after. Oh, you thought you could get away. We caught you anyway. Evil, evil stuff. So in Yin, they traded protection from slavers for exposure to brindled ghouls and other horrors. They couldn't swim in the river, though I suppose they could fish in it. And the so-called queer fruits and strange spices are listed as a good thing. So we'll take their word on it. And some of the Roinar would have had some success finding wealth. But those flesh worm things and, and this other list of diseases, again, there's so many of them. Clearly, it's a lot more bad than good. And there's no suggestion of Roinar technology or magic making any significant kind of headway here, despite our guesses that it might have. Maybe it's just not mentioned, but it, we don't have a lot to go on, uh, anything to think of positively there. And again, probably a lot of fear. They're trying to find a new permanent home, but would really any of this seem promising? Would they have at any point been like, this is going to work out? I don't know. I don't think so. For more than a year, the Roinar struggled to survive in Sothorius, until the day when a boat from Zamatar arrived at Yin to find that every man, woman, and child in that haunted, ruined city had vanished overnight. Then, Nymeria summoned her people back to the ships and set sail once again. Was it the Brindled Men? Probably. It could be some other undocumented nightmare from the jungles or below the city, which... We should always consider when there's a Lovecraft influence, which there very much is in Yin, because Lovecraft loved to have things kind of come up from below, whether the depths of the earth or from the sea. So, strong possibility here. Two full towns on Basilisk Point were destroyed and enslaved. All the population of Yin was gone. Others on Basilisk Point and Zamatar lost to disease and other raids from other slavers, plus the Brindled Men. And whatever else we don't even have names for. Earlier, I suggested maybe the Roinar didn't lose half their remaining population while on Sothorios, but when I lay it all out like this, it doesn't sound far-fetched at all. It almost sounds likely. Maybe, it, actually, it, uh, it does sound likely. I'll, I'll amend that. Let's say it's likely. And the Roinar are the example in the histories, the world of ice and fire, of what can go wrong in Sothorios. The phrase, 
we have already seen how Nymeria fared on its shores when she attempted to settle her people there, appears in the World of Ice and Fire. It's difficult to imagine that many people argued with the decision to leave. I find it easier to imagine many people arguing to leave sooner. <laughs> did, did, like, finally, let's get the hell out of here. Or the green hell out of here. Did, did any stay behind? I guess that out of so many thousands of people, a few did. Probably not many, though. We definitely don't have evidence of significant numbers staying behind. And we should consider the inverse question. We asked it at the beginning of the episode, but as a general question, not to specific locations, which is, did any of the locals go with them? Did any people join the Roinar? I think that would be appealing. A ticket out of Sothorios? Yeah, get the hell out of there. Get Again, get the green hell out of there. How cool would it be if Nymeria had a brindled man among her bodyguards, or a brindled woman? Alone, or with new friends, it was adios Sothorios, and to the west they went. Among the islands. We're told, quote, for the next three years, the Roinar wandered the southern seas seeking a new home. So it seems that the dream of making a new home on their own was set aside, because by returning their ships west, they were headed towards lands long claimed by others. Given it said this span of their journey took about three years, that's a good amount of time for some interesting things to happen. But in terms of an entire population living somewhere, it's not that long. However, it is that long in another sense, which is with regard to their population. Remember that they'd have had a lot of young teenagers, too young to fight in the wars versus Valyria, but close. So now they'd be of age. They'd have come of age during these journeys. However, again, like Sothorios, these new locations didn't work out either, and people died. But a lot less people died, and in less creepy ways. They still faced slavery, but they didn't have to face anything near as bad as brindled men, or basilisks, or wyverns, or even war, really. They got a reprieve from all those things with very few exceptions, slavery being one of them, which is probably the worst of all those things. But still, getting rid of all that other stuff is nice. You may notice I didn't mention them getting a break from horrible, deadly diseases, though. Yeah, they didn't get that break, at least not yet. Nath. Northwest of Sothorius, in the Summer Sea, lies the mysterious island of Nath, known to the ancients as the Isle of Butterflies. The people native to the island are a beautiful and gentle race, with round, flat faces, dusky skin, and large, soft amber eyes, oft flecked with gold. The peaceful people... The Nathi are called by seafarers, for they will not fight even in defence of their homes and persons. The Nathi do not kill, not even beasts of the field and wood. They eat fruit, not flesh, and make music, not war. Sounds great, right? Well, if we take a look at where it is, extremely far from Westeros, but not really that far from Sothorius, that's a problem. Missande, of course, the most famous of the characters from Nath. She's brilliant with languages and diplomacy in particular, but really, she's just brilliant in general. Barristan thinks of her, quote, 11 years of age, yet Missande is as clever as half the men at the table and wiser than all of them. It's easy to forget that she's only 11 years old and 10 when we meet her because her HBO parallel is played by an adult woman and quite well. You know, it'd be easier to remember the original Missande from the books if Natalie Emanuel was a poor actress or if they chose someone else who was a poor actress. But Natalie Emanuel doesn't have golden eyes either, so it's easy to forget that. It's hard to hear those mentioned and not think of the children of the forest, right? By the end of A Dance with Dragons, Barristan describes her as a forlorn little ghost. Sad, right? Everyone else is off searching for Daenerys or getting ready for war, and she's this very small girl all by herself in the royal apartments. I expect she'll be reunited with Danny soon enough, though. Interestingly, she doesn't want to go back home. Indicates her people don't have much in the way of defense. Originally, Masande was taken by slavers from, of course, the Basilisk Isles, and she fears that if she goes back there, it'll happen again. And if you look where Nath is on the map, you'll see again, it's not far from the Basilisks. She must have been very young, and she was probably captured with her family, because three of her brothers were taken and put into training to be unsullied. Let that sink in a minute. Think of the Unsullied and their brutal training and how violent they are taught to be. And these, Nathi, are the peaceful people. They're basically a culture of vegan pacifists. How do you turn that into a brutal warrior? One of the three brothers is unnamed. He didn't make it through the harsh training. 
The other two, Masador and Marcellin, did. Normally, two out of every three boys die during the process, but in this case, two out of three survived, so they actually beat the odds, even though it sounds really sad. Both took their old names back when they regained their freedom. Of course, they weren't called Masador and Marcellin while they were in control of the Giscari. And like others, when freed by Queen Dani, they stayed with her. Mas Masador stayed with the Unsullied completely, but was killed by the Sons of the Harpy in one of their many strikes on Dani's people. Masande wept for him, and we hope she won't have to weep for her other brother at some point. But we are braced for that because this is a Song of Ice and Fire. And Marcellin will be in danger. He joined one of the three companies of freedmen formed in Marine, who were all very loyal to Daenerys, but not Unsullied. He was at first a trainer, something I imagine Unsullied would be really good at. No training he could put them through would be as harsh as what he went through, and every single person being trained would know that. They'd be aware that he's gone through much worse. For dead certain they would know that. And that respect carried over, as we see Marcellin is named commander of the Mother's Men, the company he trained. So he trained them, and I guess along the way they gained so much respect for him that they named him their leader. He is part of Barristan's war council near the end of A Dance with Dragons, as they're preparing to assault the slavers. Missandei's suggestions for Barristan regarding bribing the sellswords were important here as well, and he thinks of how clever she is there. So Nath has a few key representatives with Daenerys. We do know that the Nathy before the Doom were not nearly as isolated as they are now. Before the Doom, Valyria was restrained in raiding Nath, which might seem odd because Valyria was greedy for slaves, and the Nathy are considered prized slaves because they're so peaceful. Is this a conundrum? Not exactly. The Valyria, Valyria did still do slave raids on Nath, just not nearly as many as they would have, because... Well... There was another reason they liked Nath, and they didn't want to disrupt this industry, which was the Nathy silk industry, which was apparently the best in the world at the time. But slavery did destroy the industry over time by forcing the Nathy to live further inland. They had a significant trade industry prior to the major increase in slave rates. So these slave rates started to come from other places after the doom, because, like I said, Valyria was kind of restrained. So the Roinar would have come to Nath during the time that they were still more active in trade with the Outsiders. From the second the Roinar pulled up in their ships, there would be reason for optimism, right? You got finely crafted silk, you got nice looking people, you got, more importantly, none of these nice looking people are armed. Throughout this episode, we've tried to look through the eyes of the Roinar, tried to imagine what it might be like. We tried to tap into their perspective, and we've talked a lot about fear and these sites would look way less scary than Centurios, right? This might seem like paradise by comparison to what they just went through. I mean, you show up and these guys are just sitting there eating fruit, chilling in their well-made clothes. They probably have like hammocks and stuff too. They, that's not scary at all. It's like, hey, this looks good. Some might be wary of a trap though. They'd be so traumatized from past experiences, it might seem too good to be true. To some, feeling relief would be a luxury not yet earned, too soon to declare victory, and they'd be right. This was not a safe haven. This was a new and terrible form of sorrow, insidious in that it seemed like there was hope, but really there never was. There was never a chance this would work out. Many would have felt relief at finding a place that looked like a good home. It would be perfect to some. It would seem that way. They would feel that hope, but the pessimists would be right. No matter how peaceful and welcoming the natives are, no matter how idyllic the islands are, it's deadly there. For some evil humor lurks in the very air of this fair isle, and all those who linger too long on Narth soon succumb. Fever is the first sign of this plague, followed by painful spasms that make it seem as if victims are dancing wildly and uncontrollably. In the last stage, the afflicted sweat blood and their flesh sloughs from their bones. Okay, maybe we've had enough of the diseases for one episode. The Roinar at this time surely agreed. Amazing, really. They survived Sithurios, meaning surviving tattooed lizards, giant basilisks, brindled ghouls, wyverns, and slavers. Those are nothing. Fear the butterflies. And that's because some believe the butterflies of Nath transmit this disease. The slavers have learned to only come at night when the butterflies are asleep. So the theory 
seems pretty strong. Given this, should the Rhoynar have known better? It appears fairly well documented that Nath is not a place one can migrate to because of this sickness. This was something like seven centuries ago, and maybe fewer people knew of this then. And again, we have the issue of the inward-facing Rhoynar, so it does at least fit that they would be ignorant of some of the problems facing other civilizations around the world. But Valyria knew not to live there, and the Giscari before them many centuries earlier. Somehow the Rhoynar didn't get the memo, though. But didn't the Nathy tell them? You got the nicest, friendliest people and on the planet, and they didn't tell them about the horrible death that they'd all be facing soon? Maybe it was a language barrier. Or maybe the Nathy, it's a cultural reason. They just see it as judgment from their God, and they're not going to interfere with that process. You don't walk into court and start tearing things up. As weird as that parallel seems, that might have been how they saw it. Jar Jar Martin has this way of giving us sad nuance, even in his world building. And this chapter in the Rhoynar Odyssey has a lot of that. This could have been a wonderful fusion of two cultures. They had a shared love of music and craftsmanship and may have gotten along well in the long term, but the long term simply wasn't possible. Nymeria, this time, wouldn't have had to encourage anyone. Even if It probably wasn't needed in the Sithorios, but here it was a guarantee. Despite how otherwise great the place was, when people start sweating blood and their skin literally falls off, everyone knows it's time to go. In my mind, at least a few of the Nathy went with them. I doubt Nymeria found any warriors like Masador or Marcellin, who were only warriors because they were forced to be. From what we know, the Nathy don't have fighters. But maybe she had her own version of Masande, some bright, talented advisor or friend, or maybe several of those. That's my headcanon. The Summer Isles. South of Westeros, cradled in the deep blue waters of the Summer Sea, the Summer Isles bask in the warm southern sun. More than fifty islands make up this verdant archipelago. Many are so small a man could walk across them in an hour, but Jahala, largest of the isles, stretches two hundred leagues from tip to tip. Beneath its towering green mountains of vast forests, Steaming jungles, beaches of green and black sand, mighty rivers teeming with monstrous crocodiles and fertile vales. Walano and Umboru, though less than half the size of Jahala, are each larger than all the stepstones combined. These three islands are home to more than nine-tenths of the peoples of the isles. Flowers of a thousand different sorts bloom in profusion on the summer isles, filling the air with their perfume. The trees are heavy with exotic fruits, and a myriad of brightly coloured birds flitter through the skies. From their plumage, the summer islanders make their fabulous feathered cloaks. Beneath the green canopies of the rainforests, prowl spotted panthers larger than any lion, and packs of lean red wolves. Tribes of monkeys swing through the branches of the trees above, Apes abound as well, the old red men of Omboru, silver pelts in the mountains of Jala, night stalkers on Walano. The summer islanders are a dark people, black of hair and eye, with skins as brown as teak or as black as polished jet. Longest quote of the episode there. Ah, I did that on purpose. It may not have been fully relevant, but I just like hearing McCall do these quotes, and I went with a long version for that. But it also fits because the Summer Islands and their people are a rather large story, much larger than that of Sothorios or the Basilisk Isles or Nath, probably as large as all three combined, given the number of pages devoted to them in the world of Ice and Fire this plays out. And though there are quite a few amazing stories written and written in between the lines, as always, we find lots of that, there was no real drama from them with regard to Nymeria and the Rhoynar. For these reasons, a full treatment of the Summer Islands will come in another episode. Like Gagasos, it's just too big and too off-topic. The Rhoynar were given a place to live called Abulu, and then the Summer Islanders kind of just left them alone as far as we can tell. The Valyria was an issue. The, the Summer Islanders were wary of upsetting Valyria. They don't, don't want to make an enemy of Valyria, and you still want to be able to trade with them, which is an important factor in Summer Islanders' existence. They're a big trading culture. But as far as we can tell, surely they did trade with the Rhoynar and interacted with them in other ways, like small scale, maybe some marriages here and there. But there isn't much documentation of that, and it probably just went fairly smoothly. We don't hear of any great animosity or cultural shock or recurring ill will. 
And again, this is probably because, in part, because of how the cultures were. They both were like that. This is kind of how they are. But also because they probably knew each other before this. The Summer Islanders have been trading all over the world for eons, so there's no way they didn't know about the Roin and the Roinar. They certainly traded with them in the past. So, again, like Nath, at first it would have seemed, on the surface, like this could have worked out great. Given the similarity between the people, Summer Islanders were ancient as a culture. They were well-traveled. They were, you know, intelligent and had a deep history. They hated slavery, and the slavers knew to mostly stay away from the Summer Islands because the Summer Islanders are really good at defending themselves. In fact, it's said that a lot of slave ships run from the Summer Islander swan ships. And as it was with Nath, the exchange of art and music and other forms of culture was probably robust. There was probably a lot there on both sides for the others to like. Abulu, a small, desolate isle northwest of Wolano, served for more than two years as home to Nymeria and her followers. The princes of the isles refused to allow her to settle on the larger islands for fear of waking the wrath of Valeria. As most of Nymeria's people were female, Abulu became known as the Isle of Women, a name it still bears today. So what went wrong? Despite the reputation of the Summer Islanders and that anti-slavery stance that I mentioned, the Isle of Women was still rated for slaves. I guess people eventually knew that that island didn't have any swan ships, so there were Roinar there for the pickings. Somehow they found out. Uh, there were still some issues with the disease as well, but nothing nearly as bad as the Thorios, let alone Nath. Yet, add those things together, and we're getting somewhere. And then there's a third problem added on top of that. If you're wondering why Abulu was even available for colonization, considering how ancient the Summer Islanders are as a, as a people, you're on the right track. It wasn't a good place to live. It was crappy. It's not scary like Sathorios, but it had the very mundane but major problem of not being able to support the population. Simply put, there wasn't enough food. The fertile soil was lacking. There was only a small amount of that. This time, we do know that some of the Roinar chose to stay behind. Apparently, a few thousand. With most of the population leaving, well, maybe with a few who stayed behind, a few thousand who stayed behind, there was enough food for them. It wasn't enough for the whole group, but paring it down, it worked. So it seems the rest could manage with the available farming and fishing and hunting. And now, Abulu is called the Isle of Women, because the Roinar population was mostly women. So the few thousand who stayed behind, most of those were women. Though it's doubted by many maesters, the Summer Islanders told Lomas Longstrider that their ancestors founded cities on the western coasts of Sothorios, quote, only to have them overwhelmed and destroyed by the same forces that wiped out later Giscari and Valyrian settlements on that perilous continent. I tend to believe the Summer Islanders, though, especially given that they have some of the best ships and most interest in exploration, plus this other quote. There are certain indications that explorers from Koj may well have mapped the western coasts of Sothorios to the very bottom of the world and discovered strange lands and stranger peoples far to the south or across the endless waters of the Sunset Sea. But the truth of these tales is known only to the princes of the isles and the captains who serve them. So they had to leave again. Establishing a new home in a place without others didn't work. Thorios was a fail. The available options for living with others to this point didn't work either. Nath, Summer Islands, nope. So the remaining choice was even more against their existing sensibilities and their sense of independence. It had been a part of their culture for so long, but they were out of choices. This is a different kind of fear of the unknown. The fear of putting yourself in someone else's power. The fear of living under someone else's laws, the fear of intentionally joining a new society that you're unfamiliar with as a minority. And the fear of running out of options, though, existed as well. The fear of not getting a chance to test those other options if this one fails. The fear of, if Dorne doesn't work, are we stuck here? We were able to leave Sathoris. We were able to leave Nath. We were able to leave the Summer Islands. But... Maybe we won't be able to leave if this one fails. So lots of things to make them anxious, lots of things to make them scared. Well, 
As we know, those fears were eventually put to rest. It did work out, and dramatically so. But they didn't know that at the time. They didn't know what they were getting into. So it wasn't easy. But it was a great story. And we'll tell that one in a future episode of History of Westeros podcast. The story of Nymeria and the Rhoynar coming to Dorne and becoming a permanent and remembered and lasting part of that culture. It's still said to this day, the people of the Rhoynar are still mentioned in the title for King of the Iron Throne. I have a confession to make. I normally say the word wyvern, not wyvern, but I actually said wyvern this whole episode just for the old man and the wyvern pun. The things I do for puns. Shea is the best, especially for putting up with all those puns, but also for all the production work, the video editing, and a lot of other things you see behind the scenes or don't see behind the scenes. Writing for this episode was by me, with a big assist from Rhaenys Targaryen. Audio editing was also done by me. The voices for this episode was McCall Schick, who you all have heard plenty of times by now, I hope. Look her up at at Ink as Rain on Twitter, and she's also on the Vassals of Kingsgrave podcast. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld for the map shots and the video intro. Lots of amazing maps to be found at claradox.de. That's K-L-A-R-A-D-O-X dot D-E. Thanks to Joey Townsend for the intro music and Jesse Kowal for the outro music. And thanks to all the artists whose art we used for this episode and for all episodes. We love how much great content comes from the fans of A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones. And thanks to the mysterious BR, Hand of the King. The Smiling Wolf, Lord Stephen Stark of the Broken Tower. Soldier, scholar, philosopher, diplomat. Hand of Queen Ashea, who is known as the best. Lady Suzanne Sinistral, the learned, holder of the left-handed Valyrian shears called Penance, Hand of the Beard. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog and Warden of the West. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabethian Frozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington is Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. Lord James Tuttle is King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, Commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet led by Flagship Caraxes and the Bloodstone Fleet led by Flagship Prince Daemon. Lord James Tuttle seems to have no problem getting loot from Sothorios. He must know something we don't. Charlotte Oster is Corsair Queen of the Western Shivering Sea, Commander of the Briny Fleet whose flagship is the barnacle-encrusted Violet-Hulled Mercenaria. She carries the nacre-inlaid Shucking Blade Crass Lover. A lot of rumors going around that the Corsair Queen gives orders directly to the Corsairs of the Basilisk Isles, but when asked, she denied any knowledge of such dealings. Our small council includes Lord Robert Jacobs, Master of Coin, Lord Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Master of Ships, Grand Maester Via James, and Lord Benjamin of House Hornwood, Master of Laws. The Queen's High Council, Lady Mai Emerald Eyes, Voice of House Swan, Mistress of Whisperers. Grand Maester Elizabeth, middle daughter of Lyanna Mormont, first lady to forge both the silver and Valyrian steel link. And we have some spots open, the Mistress of Ships, Coin, and Laws. Thanks to Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell is Breaker of the Second Stone. Lord Skip of the Velt is Lord of Castle Ganges. Gregor the Toasty is Lord of the Breadfort. Alicia Everlasting of the Greenblood is Lady of Desert Rose. Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass. Lord Garen de Havilland is of Devil's Hand Keep. Ashlyn Winter is the Hawk's Eye, Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is Leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance. The Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Bemmy Snugglebunny is Guardian of the Hudden Hundred Acre Werewood, Dual Wielding Glorious Morning and Little Light Wise. Brian the Defender is Lord of the Spear Fort and the Freelands, last scion of Clan McCulloch, Strength and Courage. The Bastard of the Wolfswood is First Forester of the Old Gods, sworn to House Iron Werewood, listen for the silence. Connor the Dungeon Master is Lord of Catamount Keep and Guardian of the Smoky Mountain Pass. Lady Baelish is Dark Widow of Harrenhal. Lord Sidney Jesse is the Fallborn, Lord of Blue Spring. Sir Valentin of House to Gen is creator of the Game of Predictions, Free Game of Thrones Futures Market. Lady Liana Kelly is of Wolf Island, protectress of the Steelhold. Casey Stark is of House Acres. And Lady Kay of House Archer is Lady of Earth Dog Hall, Huntress of the Wolfswood, and Guardian of Maddie Squirrel's Bane, the Mighty Dire Weenie. 
Our King's Justice is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. Our King's Guard includes Sir Dolorous D, longest tenured White Sword, Willa Crosbane, Guardian of White Tree, First Lady of the Free Folk, and Sir Dean the White, Knight of the Black Star. The Queen's Guard. Lord Captain Commander Hama Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel, Lady Nymeria of House Sea Pirtle, Alexander of House Atreides from the Seat of Dune. I must not fear, fear is the mind killer. Becca the Bard, Songbird of the North. Michonne the Melodious, Star of Old Town, Minds Over Masters. Ser Rambo, Knight of House Ganon, First Blood. Ser Leon of House Walker, wielder of the twin Valyrian steel blades, Fire and Ice and the Werewood Bow, Rain. The Beard Guard includes Lord Commander George the Golden, Sir Joshua Oakhart, the White Oak, Lady Rita of the Coppermane, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor, Sir Jeff, Warden of the AC, Wielder of Triad, the Multifaceted Beard of Platinum, Red and Brown, Stay Frosty, Sir Tim Corgyle, Mad Boy of the Western Desert. Welcome to Robert the Red Wolf, Sir Dennis the Dreamer, the Bastard of the Green Dragon, Knight of the Spliff, and Dreamway the Hermit. Hello to Mera, Woods Witch of the Werewood Grove, sworn to Shepard of the Whispering Children. Strambo, the Four-Eyed Raven Fool, an occasional fixer for House Reed, Fly by Night. The history of Westeros Night's Watch is led by Lord Commander Benjen Umber, the Silent Giant, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Greatsword Winter's Kiss. First Ranger Zacnafane Fourfeathers is fastest bow in the watch. First Builder Magor Snow, aka Magor the Cool, is the fire in the snow. First Steward Sir Jurion of the Torrentine is called Pale Wind. You can get cool names like that, either made up by you or by us, by joining us at patreon.com slash historyofwesteros at any level. Other levels include access to bonus episodes, shoutouts, access to our scripts, and other fun goodies. You'll have to check in every once in a while because like we do with the show, we're always making changes to our Patreon to try to improve it and to make it more mutually beneficial. That's it for this time. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time. And once again, Valar Reredus.